Thank you for checking out Murder Dictionary Podcast. I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we are still learning the ropes of audio and podcasting in general. The sound quality and content will get better as we get more experience, so please bear with us through this learning curve. We focus mostly on the murderers, so some listeners may feel that the subject is approached too lightheartedly and with a lack of focus on the victims. Although we want to be sensitive to that, we cannot help but focus on the details or facts that we find most fascinating. And for us, that is often the life of the murderer and the details of the crimes. We appreciate you checking us out and hope that you are also interested in the stories that we are intrigued enough by to explore. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. Welcome to another episode of Murder Dictionary Podcast. I am Brianna, and with me is Kelly. Hey! Today, we are discussing brothers. B is for brothers. Bros. We're exploring why family is the other F word. <laughs> like, fucking suck. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few cases for you, and we're going to kick it off with the Reigns brothers. Larry and Danny Reigns. I Grew, uh, grown up in Woodward, Michigan, in an abusive and unstable home. Larry was one year older than his brother, Danny. They were the middle two children of four. The oldest and youngest were girls. In their childhood, the Reigns brothers were close. Danny later called Larry the only companion I had most of my life. How sweet. Aw. And we murdered. <laughs> yeah. Brothers. <laughs> uh, their father was an alcoholic who got mean when he drank. I mean... Surprise. Don't they all. <laughs> yeah. And would hit whoever was close by. I mean, I just want to hear about the one alcoholic that was just like super awesome yeah. when he was drunk. Like, I had an alcoholic father, but he was super fun. He gave hugs all the <laughs> like, time. Like, so many hugs. Yeah, tell me how much he'd go into like those like super crazy, like, man, I love you. I love okay. You so much. I'm I, so proud of yeah. you. Yeah. You're just, you're just it, man. Like, you're <laughs> so cool. All right. So each of the kids took a share of the abuse before their father finally walked out. But by that time, the damage was done. He's probably like, <laughs> my job is done here. I've created two serial killers. I'm out. Peace out, you guys. <laughs> yeah, peace out. God's work. <laughs> <laughs> the brothers modeled the use of violence uh, to get through life, and the boys took out their frustrations on each other. They were close, but they also competed aggressively, both loving and hating each other, which seems like kind of normal for brothers. It's, yeah, it doesn't sound like anything. It's too like, crazy. Yeah, you just terrorize each other when you're young and then love each other when you're older. Yeah. So that's cool. In prison interviews, Larry said, I used to hit Danny with boards, throw knives at him, shoot him with bows and arrows, and shit like that. The usual. <laughs> the usual. <laughs> Which isn't too far off. And then, you know, some people that I... Boys, am I right? <laughs> yeah. I'm six boys brothers. Will be boys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know all about that. It's, yeah. How many times did you get shot with a bow and arrow? <laughs> like seven. At least seven. <laughs> <laughs> so while Larry Raines had no criminal record throughout his adolescence, he had been a known troublemaker. Danny Raines, on the other hand, went to prison for assault and was paroled in early in 1972 when he was 28. Within a month, Danny committed another crime. Larry had tried the military but ended up in the stockade for the latter part of his stint before he was discharged. Larry has suicidal thoughts in one attempt, which he claims if his depression was treated earlier, he would not have been driven to murder. 
I don't know. I know a lot of depressed people. I have trouble buying that. Yeah, like, I just, I mean, most of the time they murder themselves, right? Well, like, like you, You've got to start somewhere with some sort of uh, serial killer makings to be able to yeah. go there. Alcohol There's is There's a father, lot of though. depressed people. There's a shit ton of people. Yeah. You know? I mean, I guess if your brother's, you know, fucking up. Shooting you with their hooks. Yeah. <laughs> and he's getting, you know, locked up and stuff. You might as well follow in his footsteps. In late 1963, Larry Raines had been admitted to the hospital and a doctor had diagnosed him as a sociopathic personality. Since Larry was experiencing a mental health crisis, he thought that in his life, uh, or that his life may not last very long, and felt that he wanted to wander across the U.S. Again, just trying to travel, eat, pray, love. Yeah, (laughs) see the world (laughs) before I fucking kill myself. And murder the entire world. Yeah, he hitchhiked all the way to Nevada and back in three months. Along the way, he shot several people, including drivers that picked him up and gas station attendants. I just... I feel like I know this was a different time, but I just never understand hitchhiking. And I guess that's just growing up in the era where like everybody knew that people who hitchhike get murdered. Yeah, you're the 80s, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that was just something we knew. But you're younger than me. And I hitchhiked and all the time. Totally put yourself in that situation. <laughs> well, we didn't have Lyft and Uber, so I yeah. mean, you got to do what you got to do. Neither did I. I was just like, well, I guess I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I was like, um, I got to get home. So I'm not staying here at this party. The party's done. It's just three of us at a table smoking. Like, I'm going to go find a stranger, yeah. a murderer to take me on a drive. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I always made sure I could grab the door in case any like I would definitely pick and it's I don't know why I asked which is so stupid like so stupid when I got the car like you're not gonna do anything weird right like <laughs> same as like you're not a cop right, right? like yeah. nobody's gonna say gonna yeah say I'm it. totally a cop yeah. I'm totally a murderer fuck you got me I was totally gonna fucking play with your panties but since you asked yeah no panty play for you fuck. we're good <laughs> I'm not going to take that ride. Thank God for Lyft. <laughs> <laughs> Saving lives. Yeah. In the spring of 1964, a ca- um, Kalamazoo, Michigan school teacher named Gary Smock went missing. Uh, 19-year-old Larry Raines had just returned from his hitchhiking stint, and then shot Gary Smock and put him in the trunk of his car. Uh, was that Gary's car or his car? Because why would you hitchhike if you have a yeah, car? Yeah, <laughs> I think it was Gary's car, but I don't remember. <laughs> You had a car the entire fucking time? Oh, my God. Just kind of playing. Yeah. Just playing hitchhike. (laughs) Yeah. It's my favorite game. It's a cool game. (laughs) Yeah. He had taken his watch, shoes, and money. That's fucked up. By May, Larry had told several people that he had murdered a man and had decided to commit suicide. But one of his friends, he told, turned him in. Way to go, friend. (laughs) Seriously. That's the right way to do it. Just always, it doesn't matter how close you are, turn your friend in. Yeah, fucking snitch on him, dude. Good job, dude. Yeah. Um, snitches don't get stitches, they get pats on the back. Right from us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the official statement of Murder Teacher <laughs> Podcast. We're all for snitches. Yeah. Go ahead and snitch. Snitch if you don't even think, like, if you just see a lady, like, passed out on the side, just snitch. Just, you just know. Just do it. Yeah. Like, come on. Maybe, <sighs> like, something might be awry here. Let's yeah. just check it out. And if you're wrong, and you're then, wrong. Yeah. It's Fuck better it. to just, just check it out. Yeah. So, he was arrested on June 4th, 1964, while wearing smocks, watch, and shoes. I don't want to put my Myself in a place where I'm like, if I were a murderer, but seriously, if yeah. I were a murderer, that would be the first thing I would do. Yeah. Like, come on, get rid of everything. Yeah. What a fucking idiot. Be like, uh, these Jordans? No, they're not Gary Smock Jordans. <laughs> I'm definitely not. I, I didn't got these Jordans from all the hitchhiking I did. <laughs> yeah. By, you know, earning money, yeah. getting in people's cars. I might have hitchhiked to a footlocker. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so shortly after arriving at the station, uh, he met and talked alone with a priest for about an hour. Why is there a priest at the police station? That's a little confusing <laughs> to me. I don't get it. I get why they would be at a hospital, but just was he there because he's a pedophile? Yeah. Or I don't get he's, it. He's going there for other crimes. He's like, no, I got this, cops. I can do this. This is, let me get this. So they keep uh, him on hand just in case people want to confess. Yeah, maybe? like, oh, I'll tell a priest. That makes sense. And you're just kind of trapping him. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're not gonna lie to Jesus, are you? Don't lie to Jesus, you guys. <laughs> uh, immediately thereafter, he was informed that he had a right to an attorney, but Reigns waived his right and admitted he committed the murder. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Never admit it. <laughs> yeah, like, I want you to, like, I'm all for, like, him being brought to justice, but, like, come on, you have the right to an attorney, like, might as well just see how far it gets you. Yeah, I could never see myself giving up that. Yeah, what a fucking quitter. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh, so, he immediately confessed, and he said that he'd killed uh, four other times over the past few months, including in other states. 
Despite the confession of five murders, the state tried Larry only for the killing of Smock, which makes no sense. Mm. Uh, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Once again, there's a very big it's same a theme here. Yeah. And I feel like it's also a theme that people only get caught for a couple of their crimes or a small yeah. percentage. Like, I feel yeah. like that's one thing you see a lot is like, well, I guess if they just have enough evidence for one of them, then it's easier to go for that than yeah. the ones that they don't have as much evidence. But that makes sense. I don't know. I wish that that wasn't the case. And maybe for a plea bargain, they can kind of like uh, be like, hey, tell us about these murders and we'll right. cut down the sentence a little bit. But uh, it seems like that never happens. No, and it's they probably just, never had enough. one murder out of 80. Fucking. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's, that's totally gotcha. fair. <laughs> okay, so pleaded by uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, but he was sentenced to life in prison. He was later awarded a retrial, but he entered a plea of guilty and received a life sentence. In return for the plea, Larry was allowed to change his name to Monk Steppenwolf. <laughs> that's my favorite part, because I like to envision the judge just being like, all right, you're all good in my book, <laughs> yeah. bro. We you went, got your name changed. I like your style, chief. Went, went from Gary to Monk. Like. <laughs> Around the time of his retrial, Larry's brother, Danny Rains, made international headlines for carrying out a collection of violent murders in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, on March 18th, 1972, uh, Patricia Hauk? Uh, I think so. Hauk. It's like Hawk with an O. Confusing. She's 29, left home with her 17-month-old son, Corey, to do some shopping. Danny had seen the woman go into a Topps department store and had parked his blue van next to her car to wait. An hour went by and she came out and put her son into the passenger seat. There's laws nowadays where you have to keep a baby that small in the back. Turned around. Yeah, yeah. this is also 1972, so they, what am I talking about? Who the fuck knows about raising a child <laughs> yeah. in the 70s, you know? Lock they just baby. let him run around in the trunk. Yeah, you're lucky it didn't strap you to the hood. You're <laughs> looking good. As she came around to the driver's seat where the van was, Danny got out, walked up to her, and pulled a knife. She panicked and fell into the car, but he pulled her out and forced her to get into his van, where he bound and raped her. They struggled so hard that they fell out of the van to the ground, where Rain stabbed her to death. Fuck. Parking lot death. Stabbing, that's the thing. Yeah, stabbing. Yeah, parking lot deaths and stabbings. Yeah. I just, I don't want to be stabbed. Please don't yeah. stab me. Especially not outside a fucking department store named Top. <laughs> I was just trying to, like, get my shop on. Yeah. It's like stabbing me in the parking lot of Ross or something. I'm just imagining. I've never been to a Top. I trying to dress for less. <laughs> yeah. Just, and I got murdered. Fuck. Oh, Should have went to Nordstrom. <laughs> Um, somehow the 17 month old child got out of the car and was standing near the van crying Danny figured out the boy wouldn't recall anything because he was too young so he left him alone the 17 month old boy wandered aimlessly until an elderly woman found him the next day how long did it take someone to pick up a baby? He was like, just walking around by himself, <laughs> and I bet a shit ton of people saw it. Like, this was outside a department store. Yeah. How many people passed by and were just like, that baby's got it. He's yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, the mom's drunk. She's just laying there. She'll that wake baby up. looks really streetwise. Yeah. I think he can take care of that drunk mom. Yeah. Probably because he was smoking a cigarette. I mean, right? He's holding a knife. He's yeah. Like combing his hair, <laughs> being real chill. Yeah, just waiting on mom to get out of her drunk state. So the elderly woman found him and she called the police. The boy had blood on him, so they searched for his mother and found a uh, hulk. Hoax body. Bo uh, I can't do it. <laughs> they found her body behind the independent elevator company building. Uh, so months later, Danny bragged about the crime to 15-year-old Brent Coster and suggested the pair up to commit similar crimes. Coster agreed to try it, so they put together a kit with knives, trash bags, and ropes and went cruising. Like, I know at 15, you're very susceptible to peer pressure. That's a thing. Yeah. But I can't imagine someone coming to me at 15 and being like, so I really like murder. Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah. He, at a 15 years old, was just like, yeah, I'm down. Let's yeah. do this. Let's put together a little kit. Yeah. A murder kit. You know what we need? Trash bags. <laughs> but not <laughs> the shit kind. trash bags. Yeah. The hefty ones. Yeah. The yeah. good ones that last a while. Yeah. Not 99 cent store trash bags. They planned it out. He said that they had once parked in front of a movie theater for four hours looking for an opportunity and often went looking for female hitchhikers i feel like they should have just sat outside a mall like yeah that like been... you know where the girls are Come yeah on. 
They passed the time with talk about sex and killing women. Uh, although Coster said that Reigns initiated most of it. it was I can't all imagine him. sitting around as a teenager just talking to this adult man about murder yeah. and rape for hours. Yeah. But like, this guy seems cool. He's yeah. chill. <laughs> He's real chill. He yeah. could probably buy me beer. Yeah. Ugh. Maybe he was in it for the beer the whole time. He's like, <laughs> God, I hope this guy pulls out weed. <laughs> but it's, in the 70s, I think that a 15-year-old probably could have bought any, anything, right? Yeah, like, like a Daisy confused Nobody that guy got it any fucking ids yeah nobody checked ids in the 90s when i was a kid yeah so <laughs> the 70s had to have been or you could just steal beers from your dad and they wouldn't notice or something exactly. like that i mean you could still do that at any age but <laughs> you, point of the story you don't need an older man to get you beer dude just sit don't outside a liquor store an old guy yeah if someone <laughs> starts beer yeah uh do it for weed though <laughs> So as they roamed around prowling, the police were still trying to solve Hawk's uh, murder. On July 5th, Reigns and Coster were at work at the Sp- <laughs> the Sprinkle Road service get- station. That sounds so friendly. That's so cute. Uh, no one's going to die there. Sprinkle Road next to Lollipop Lane. <laughs> yeah. Are they in Candyland? <laughs> uh, I want to go there. Uh, so Linda Clark and Claudia Bidstrup pulled in around 1.30 a.m. to get gas. The men tied them up, raped them, killed them, and put them in the trunk. Like, is this at the gas pump or like, right. this is dr- they pull around where's the, back, the fucking like, service attendant? Like, uh, they have to be in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Fuck. They're in the middle of nowhere on Sprinkle Road. So <laughs> fucking, uh, the coaster drove the car to a remote wooded area near Galesburg. There's a lot of hard names in here. Near <laughs> <Sorry>. Galesburg. <laughs> you guys, seriously, murder in better places. Yeah. <laughs> Much easier pronounceable places, please. Smith Street. Yeah. Main Street. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Get it together. <laughs> Where he poured gasoline over it and lit the car on fire with a cigarette, then hitchhiked back. But I, I thought you can't light cigarette. I can't th- I'm pretty sure you can't light things. Like, didn't they do that on... I like mean, Mythbusters or some shit like that. I don't know. I didn't see that. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I would assume that it would. You need a spark. Right? I don't know. As long as there's some sort of flame or Pop something. Popping holes in the story. <laughs> <laughs> this is factually inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. That murder didn't happen that way. <laughs> Pretty much he lit it on fire. So on August 5th, Reigns and Coster kidnapped 18-year-old Patricia Fearnow, which is the worst. <sighs> Very oh. unfortunate name. Oh, man. Just change it right away so you don't get murdered. How about like, to live now? <laughs> survive yeah survive now <laughs> patricia survive now <laughs> okay so as they were riding around they saw her hitchhiking on the uh, western michigan university campus they picked her up and used a knife to take her against her will to a wooded area both of them raped her and when they were finished they tied her up and took her to another wooded area near a lake Coster suffocated her with a plastic bag and rope, and then they pushed her out of the van in the woods. So, Rain said that he'd seen a police cruiser, so Coster ran away. Apparently, the police stopped to check Rain's ID and let him go. How often do you hear that yeah, in a just, story? Just like, oh, the police had them, and they let him go. We pulled him over, we let him go. Yeah. Like, whatever. It's just, we interviewed him as a witness. Yeah. he was actually the murderer. I guess he wasn't at, he probably could play it real cool. He just didn't look phased at all. He was a chill dude, yeah. bought a lot of beer for 15 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he returned to the trailer where he and Costa resided together. Coster called him later to get a ride home. That would have been the most awkward Just, ride he's home. He's like, I know what happens to hitchhiker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they went back to, uh, the next day to move the body to a more secluded area, at which time Coster found two ropes around the victim's neck. He recalled placing only one there and believed that Danny had added the second one. What the fuck? Yeah, like, weird. she's already dead. You're yeah. just putting another rope. Like, I just want to feel it. Yeah, let me just do it again. That felt good. Let's Ugh, do a second one. Creep. So, upon investigating uh, service stations close to where the car uh, where the car with the two girls in the trunk had been found, they noted Danny's record and association with Coster. So, they brought both in for questioning. Coster's lawyer told him. At least he was like, need a lawyer. Fucking right, right yeah. away. Costa's lawyer told him that if he if, um, offered details truthfully, he would be allowed to plead to second-degree murder to one of the homicides, which came with a lesser sentence, and the other charge would be dropped. Costa confessed and helped the police find the body of the last victim, Patricia Fear now. Live now. Live. <laughs> Coster said that shortly after the murder in August, he had broken off his association with Reigns because he had suggested they steal a car and go to Florida. 
Nothing good happens in Florida. This is a smart kid. Yeah, and that's what made you stop talking to him? Yeah. Like That's it. Not all like, the murder. You mentioned Florida, I'm out. Like we can't be fucking. That's the power friends. of Florida. Everybody knows. Bring up Florida and you got a ghost. He also told detectives about Rains confessing to murdering Patricia Houck. Unlike his brother Larry, Danny never confessed to the crimes, but he would convince He's of, convicted. Oh, com- oh, convinced. <laughs> Words uh, are hard, guys. <laughs> no, I swear you did it. And I'm, oh, all right, you convinced me. I fucking did it. Uh, four murders and given multiple life sentence. In a strange twist, Danny's ex-wife went on to marry Larry, a.k.a. Monk Steffenwolf, in prison. It, she was just like, this dude's got a sick-ass name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm in it for the Steppenwolf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be... <laughs> Future Mrs. Steppenwolf. <laughs> Who's going to be my bridesmaid? Yeah. <laughs> Your best man's definitely not um, Danny. So. Right? <laughs> the right. thing about this, the 15-year-old, what's his name? He was afraid that um, Danny was going to kill him. That's one of the reasons that he flipped on him. He was just like, he wants me to steal a car and yeah. go to Florida. He's planning on murdering me. Yeah. That's what it was. He was just like, I got to flip on this guy. I'm definitely being taken out for uh-huh. sure. Um, the next one that we have is the Carr brothers. In December 2000, Reginald and Jonathan Carr carried out one of the most notorious killing sprees in the history of Kansas. I mean, I don't know how many murders are in Kansas. <laughs> like, I don't know if they have a reputation for violence. I think of Kansas and a lot of peacefulness. Besides Maybe tornadoes. More. I mean, the weather is murdering people. The biggest murder is tornadoes. <laughs> yeah, them damn naders. <laughs> These are known as the Wichita Massacre or the Wichita Horror. Reginald and Jonathan Carr were born in Dodge City. Easy name. Yeah. <laughs> I got the simple ones. It's stupid car brothers. Dodge. <laughs> car. Dodge. Dumb. I get it. <laughs> dumb. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. It's Their terrible. parents had a tumultuous relationship and would turn extremely violent against one another. Their father and later their mother's boyfriends would sexually abuse their older sister. Ew. Eventually, the parents divorced and their father immediately abandoned the family. Again, like the last one, he's just like, my job is done here. Yeah, I'm out. I've created a couple serial killers. I no big them. deal. Yeah. Peace. Exactly. Their mother, Janice Harding, would go on to have a second marriage that was as violent and unsuccessful as the first one. Boo. With the husband even once putting a gun to her head. Real nice guy. In bed? Because, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I could see how that's kind of hot. I remember that I... scene in Spring Breakers? <laughs> I didn't see that. Oh, no. <laughs> do they do that? Because now I I'm going to watch I it. I feel like that maybe I made it up in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted them to do it. <laughs> I was like, that would be hot. Yeah. Um. Anyway. <laughs> was it Selena Gomez? Is she in that movie? Because I just want to put I it... I think so. Yeah, I might want to have sex with no, her. No, no, no. It was Vanessa Hudgens. Ugh. I feel like I get them easily confused. Yeah. They could have both been Yeah, in that they look movie. the same. <laughs> Occasionally, Reginald and Jonathan would also live with their maternal grandmother, who, like their mother, was also prone to sudden outbursts of rage. Their mother, Janice, was also physically abusive, often punishing them by using electrical (gasps) cords. How she used them is not exactly specified, but I'm assuming she's just whooping their asses. Whooping them or choking them out. I mean, fuck. (sighs) Definitely Um, not undoing their phone lines or anything. (laughs) I'm just trying to get some work done. I'm a handyman. No big deal. (laughs) I'm going to unhook this dial-up internet right now. I'm just going to bore you. That's the abuse. (laughs) You're going to watch me do electrical work and just be bored to shit. You're just going to sit here and listen about my day. (laughs) (laughs) So abusive. And your grandmother's day. (laughs) Their unsafe and volatile home life began causing behavioral issues. Reginald would put up fistfights at school and had a notably poor grades. Hmm. He was protective of his brother. Street smart reportedly began using drugs when he was just six. Six? What? What kind of fuck? fucking drugs? Who gives six year olds drugs? Maybe it's like those, uh, like cigarettes, the fake cigarettes that you can get. Like gum? <laughs> yeah, the bubble gum ones. From the ice cream truck. Ice cream, those were the shit. It's like man. these are drugs, but it's actually just Lucas or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a push it's pop. Chile. You know? <laughs> uh, or you just fucking getting hammered on like cough syrup. Right? Tylenol. Just going ham on that NyQuil. Yeah. Jonathan became suicidal once attempting suicide by drinking antifreeze when he was 16 oh years God. old. Oh my That sounds horrific. And not tasty oh, at all. Seriously, put some sugar on it, some <laughs> chaser. Maybe like blend it, put some colada in there, you know, maybe a couple maraschino. I made a margarita, you guys. 
<laughs> Here's to death. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> In his early adult life, Reginald had a series of failed marriages. A series? Like, how many is that? I don't know. Both <laughs> More brothers, than two. <laughs> too many. Both brothers also established lengthy arrest records. On December 8th, the two brothers began their spree by robbing 23-year-old assistant baseball coach Andrew Schreiber at gunpoint in Wichita. I bet you it's hot. All assistant baseball coaches are so hot, dude. <laughs> so right. They are because they're not baseball like old enough. in general, oh. <sighs> except for the ones that had mullets. There's yeah, like, there's like, like Kenny ways. Powers. <laughs> <That's really laughs> you're either Kenny Powers or you're just like a hot model. You yeah, know? I'd still fuck Kenny Powers. <laughs> <laughs> mullet or none. I prefer the mullet. <laughs> <laughs> they forced him to empty his bank accounts, then let him go. Okay. Three days later, at least they let him go. Yeah. Three days later, one of them, it is unknown which brother, approached Anne Malenta, a 55-year-old cellist and librarian. <laughs> oh, man. But she sounds awesome. Yeah. A cellist and a librarian. Like, that's that's so rad. <laughs> She's the nerdiest, most adorable lady ever. Yeah. I, or very grump. I know, yeah, she might oh, be cool. I guess. She could yeah. be. She'd be like, shh, at the library. <laughs> she I'm, could be that librarian. Or when she's trying to play her cello, she's like, shh. Just be quiet. Trying to provide some background music yeah. for the library and you're interrupting her. <laughs> so they approached Anne Malenta as she parked her SUV in front of her house. They held her at gunpoint in what appears to be a carjacking. She tried to drive away. Good for you, Anne. Yeah. You're smart. But the attackers shot her multiple times, severely uh. wounding her. I, mean, I mean, she you're did gonna, the right thing. Yeah, you're right? gonna do it. You don't just fall. I mean, I guess it's like instinct, but like the other lady fell to the ground. Which, yeah. what are you gonna do? That's a knife. I think I'm more afraid of a knife than a gun. Terrifying. I don't want to test that theory, but <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kels, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, for being 55, she was like, "Fuck this, I'm out." Like, yeah. mm, floor it. So yeah. good for you, lady. That was smart. Um, Sorry, you died. I know, right? Melinda's yeah. head collapsed on her car horn, alerting a neighbor who immediately called 911. Mm. Three days later, on December 14th, the Carr brothers invaded a residence at Birchwood Drive, where there were five people. There was Brad Haka, 27, Heather Mueller, 25, Aaron Sander, 29, Jason Beffert, 26, and his girlfriend, known only as HG, who is 25. Her real name hasn't been disclosed due to a policy of protecting survivors of sex crimes. Mm. So, um, I don't know. I'm kind of taken aback by these people in their early 20s just living on their own in this house. Yeah. There's something about that. I guess maybe living in L.A. where rent is so high. It's like yeah. everybody I know in their 20s is like... Mm, their parents? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So, I'm just kind of impressed by these people. Yeah, way to go. <laughs> so, the Carr brothers gathered all five residents in one room before searching the house for valuables. One of the items taken was an engagement ring that Beffert was planning on giving to H.G. No. The brothers beat up the men, sexually assaulted the two women, forced the couples to perform sex acts on each other. Oh, this is tough. They sodomized one of the victims, tied them up, and sexually humiliated them. Mm. I think all of those things fall into the category of humiliation. Just Yeah. Saying. They're I don't think pretty... that has to be separate. That's... Um, after they were done tormenting them in the house, the Carr brothers took them to a bank where they forced them to empty out their accounts and give the money to them. Fuck. After they had all the money, they drove the five captors to a snowy soccer field where they executed them one by one, shooting them in the head. Four out of the five were murdered, but a metal barrette the survivor had been wearing at the time deflected the trajectory of the bullet that was meant to kill anonymous woman H.G. Was it a fucking stainless steel barrette? I know. Or was that just the luckiest fucking thing? I know exactly what type of metal barrette it is. It's one of those clip fucking yeah. ones that snap down. I can down. like see it in my head yeah. just reading the just story. Just the ones that you find everywhere. Yes. You know? But being stylish as fuck may have saved your life. You oh, know? man. I'm always wearing barrettes from this day yeah. forward. I'm covering my so entire head. Accessories. Yeah. I've got a beanie, a barrette. I've got just like stacked barrettes on yeah. top of each other exactly. just in case people feel like uh, shooting, shooting at me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but the Carr brothers thought that all five of them were dead, so they left. Let's just wear helmets. I'm down. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm going to be super popular. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the Carr brothers fled the murder scene and returned to the Birchwood Drive home to rob it of any remaining items. Motherfuckers. <sighs> In the process, they killed the dog that was at the house. Just, uh, yeah. While the Carr brothers went back to the house, the surviving stylish as fuck HG woman anonymous ran to a nearby residence where the homeowners saw her and called 911. I uh, appreciate that because I feel like you hear these stories of survivors where they're running down the street bloody as fuck yep. and people are just running the opposite yeah, direction yeah that happens all the time there's That's like no nope, nah, i'm too scared yeah, yeah like oh my goodness so i'm glad that the neighbors called 911 yeah thank you god so many times that that does not happen and that is and crazy getting killed yeah jesus so the shocking quadruple homicide grabbed the attention of local tv news stations which is actually what helped get the car brothers arrested oh. It started when a man watching the local news remembered seeing a truck at his apartment complex whose description matched the victim's stolen truck. Oh, shit. Right? Another resident of the apartment also recalled helping one of the Carr brothers carry a large screen TV to his room. The concerned neighbors notified police and they arrested Reginald Carr. Reginald was later positively identified by the first surviving victim, Andrew Scheiber, the hot-ass baseball dude. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Meanwhile, the mother of Jonathan Carr's girlfriend came home to find Jonathan sleeping on the couch with the stolen <gasps> engagement ring in his possession. You fucking asshole. <laughs> I'm just, it, did he plant, did he take it intending to pawn it or was he going to proposed to his girlfriend yeah this, like dead person he's like i lucked out that's crazy don't have to pay for it was he wearing it like how did they I know just it was said that his... he was holding it okay i don't know i mean it's a woman's ring i don't know how dainty his hands are yeah it's like <laughs> on his pinky right <laughs> Ugh. so the girlfriend's mother called 911 and when the police arrived jonathan attempted to flee a police chase ensued and he was quickly apprehended the carjacking victim, Anne Walenta, the cellist, <laughs> <laughs> positively identified both brothers in a lineup shortly before she died from her gunshot oh, wounds. Oh, no. She was so rad. Aww. At the trial, when a trauma surgeon reenacted the shooting of Anne Walenta, the testimony was so disturbing that one of the jurors, a 51-year-old, fainted and had to be taken to the hospital. Who let the surgeon do the fuck? Like the he was just like giving the most gruesome details. Yeah, like, he's like, I minored in theater, so. <laughs> he's acting it out. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't know if you guys know, but I was a drama major. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm just gonna give you a performance. <laughs> this <laughs> is my interpretation of Anne Walenta, <laughs> cellist, gunshot victim, survivor. <laughs> I want to see him do the warm up, like shaking his cheeks on the stand. He's doing vocal exercises. <laughs> yeah. And then he finishes. He's like, and scene. Yeah. <laughs> so. Standing ovation. <laughs> everybody's just cheering. Except for the fainted lady. Throwing hats into the air. Yeah. The evidence left behind at the crime scene, as well as the testimony of the victim, Andrew Scheiber, was stronger and more convincing than testimonies defending the Carr brothers. In the end, they were found guilty of most of the counts against them. Capital murder, aggravated kidnapping, robbery, rape on all the victims from the Birchwood Drive attack, and animal cruelty. I'm glad they threw that in there. Yeah, like, you gotta get them for that. That's a good case of people just uh, putting all of all of the counts against them. Yeah, because people get off. They're like, you murdered ten people. We'll get you for one. Right. But they even got and they're the just dog. happy to get you for the one. Yeah. But they threw the book at him. That's yep. awesome. The Carr brothers were convicted of 113 criminal counts and sentenced to death. Shit. They remain on death row. Oh man, we need some new pen pals. <laughs> <laughs> You get one of the brothers, I get the other. <laughs> All right, so on to the Cook brothers. Oh, these fucking brothers. We have Anthony and Nathaniel. I actually know a pair of brothers named Anthony and Nathaniel. Are they the Cook brothers? They are not Cook. Oh. Their name is a little more Latin <laughs> than that. So, uh, Anthony and Nathaniel Cook came from a tumultuous home in Toledo, Ohio. Their parents divorced. Again, everyone's divorced. Every single one. Just stay together. I know. Yeah. 
Or just take care of your children. Just, you know, you yeah. should have more time. Even if you divorce, maybe don't be a dick. Yeah. Maybe don't beat the shit out of your kids. Exactly. Just sound advice. Like scream into a pillow or something. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many ways. Yeah. Meditate. See a therapist. Yeah, I don't know. Anything. Support groups. Okay, so their parents divorced, leaving the unemployed mother to care for her nine children. Too many. That's <laughs> way too many. You guys, enough. Fuck. <laughs> nine children. Beat up That's pussy dot com. <laughs> exactly. Fuck. Um, Anthony showed resentment and became Okay, help me with this one. Incorrigible. Word. After the divorce. His younger brother of nine years, Nathaniel, looked up to his older brother as a father figure. Anthony took to the streets at an early age, taking on the nickname Hawkeye. I just, I never have a cool nickname. What the <laughs> fuck? We need good nicknames. You can be Cockeye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that wasn't a cool nickname. <laughs> That's a janky ass nickname. <laughs> Fine, you get Monk Steppenwolf. <laughs> I'll take it. No, you're Funk Steppenwolf. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you're Irie Smith. Yes. <laughs> oh man okay so his crimes quickly escalated from minor offenses to armed robbery he dropped out of school and was arrested for robbing a man while armed with a gun after his arrest he was sent to prison while locked up the court ordered a psychological evaluation he was diagnosed with schizophrenia a psychotic disorder characterized by a loss of contact with his environment having trouble functioning in everyday life don't you like hear voices and stuff like that too with schizophrenic? Yeah. Like, and don't schizophrenic people n not know they're schizophrenic? Like if someone says, oh my God, I'm schizophrenic and then they like switch up, like. I feel like that's a characteristic of a lot of mental health struggles or they start taking medication and then feel like, oh, I'm getting better. Yeah. They stop. And but I feel like so up. many mental health issues, you wish so much that mm -hmm. your brain would work right that you just kind of. Just fake the funk. Yeah. yeah. So struggling with depression and the pains of a difficult life, Anthony attempted suicide by shooting himself at age 16, but survived his self-inflicted gunshot wound. If you that fucking shoot, if you shoot yourself in the foot, you're not going to die. I don't know. what. He, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where Dude, he shot himself. Higher. Yeah. Like try the chest or I feel your like face. it's a weird coincidence that a, like a few of the brother cases, there was one of the brothers attempted suicide. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but with a lot Guilt. of the other, well, <laughs> there is that. Yeah. But I feel like with a lot of the other cases that we've looked into, you don't find suicide as a theme. Yeah. But definitely in the brothers. Know, the brothers, it's definitely part of it. Uh, so in 1973, Anthony Cook committed his first murder when he raped and killed a 22-year-old woman named Vicky Smalls. Sounds like a porn star name. Vicky Smalls. Is that Vicky Smalls. <laughs> yeah, or a rapper name. <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't say a dead person is a porn star name. Uh, okay, so her, <laughs> sorry, Vicky. <laughs> sorry, Vicky. Vicky, Vicky Smalls. Uh, her body was dumped in Ottawa Park after she and some friends had car trouble, and Cook offered to help by giving Vicky a ride. Nope, 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 mm -mm. nope, nope. Don't do it. Nope. Um, so following the crime, Anthony went to prison on an unrelated burglary charge in, until 1979. Another theme that you see, it's just like people are going to jail for a lot of different crimes, unrelated, but can't be caught for murder. Yeah. What the hell? They're burglar. Bur burglar? <laughs> burglar. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, after getting out of jail, he joined his brother Nathaniel and the two embarked on the murder spree together. Guys, the brothers oh. that kill together stay together. <laughs> I wonder if they like held hands and skipped while they did. <laughs> right. Skipping out. <laughs> Bros, broing out, Love murdering bro. people. Yeah. So in the early 1980s, both Anthony and Nathaniel Cook were employed as truck drivers and spent time traveling between states. On May 14, 1980, the Cook brothers abducted 24-year-old Thomas Gordon and his 18-year-old girlfriend in North Toledo and took them to western Lucas County, where Mr. Gordon was shot in the stomach. His girlfriend was waped. Uh, waped. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> that's Lee Wabbit waping all these ladies. Aww, man. Uh, his girlfriend was waped and stabbed, but survived. In January 1981, the brothers raped and killed a 19-year-old hitchhiker named Connie Sue Thompson. In February, they tortured and killed a 12-year-old girl named Dawn Bax. Dawn was kidnapped on her way home from school and murdered in the basement of a local theater. In September 1981, Anthony Cook killed a couple named Todd Sabo and Leslie Sawicki. Sawicki wicky wild. Sawickety wickety wild. During the confrontation, Les Leslie escaped and phoned her father, Peter Sawicki, who arrived at the scene and was shot by Anthony Cook. That, that is 
fucking Fuck. awful. That's terrible. And okay, so Todd Sabo and Leslie Sawicki both survived, but the father, Peter Sawicki, did not recover from his gunshot wounds. Yes. Months yeah. later, Daryl Cole, 31, and his girlfriend, Stacy Bolinick, 21, were beaten to death and found in the truck of Mr. Cole's car in North Toledo. I'm never calling my dad for anything. I'm gonna call, I know, right? <laughs> I'm gonna call my biggest enemy and be like, "Come and get me." <laughs> what are you, you doing? Yeah, you might. Are have you to free fight. right now? Yeah, I really could use your help. It was during the investigation of the Sawicki murder that detectives connected Anthony Cook to the crime through an informant, and eventually developed him and his brother as prime suspects in the killing. Anthony was arrested for the murder of Sawicki and given a sentence of 15 years to life in prison. At this point in time, DNA testing was emerging as a new scientific crime tool in 1997 when prosecutor Julia Bates suggested that it be used to link the Cooks to some unsolved crimes. A search warrant was obtained for the Cooks brothers' blood and tests indicated they raped Mr. Gordon's girlfriend, which was the Cook brothers' first attack together in 1980. Despite being obtained 17 years earlier, the DNA evidence was instrumental in getting indictment, uh, indictments? Yes. Indictments. Indictments. Uh, I'm phonetic. <laughs> uh, against the, that's, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I know words sometimes. Yeah. Uh, against the cooks and bringing long sought resolution to the cases. Eventually, DNA linked the Cook brothers to a series of crimes and murders across the U.S. Nathaniel Cook was finally arrested and the brothers admitted to taking part in the murders of nine people. All of the victims were strangled, shot, or bludgeoned to death with ob- objects such as baseball bats and concrete blocks. <sighs> concrete blocks. Ah, baseball bats. <laughs> yeah, all of it. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> everything. I have two bats in my room, though, so if anyone comes to murder me, they're getting bludgeoned with a bat. Fuck uh, yes. <laughs> so Anthony Cook was implicated in all nine murders, while Nathaniel only admitted to taking part in three. In return for the confession, Nathaniel pleaded guilty to two counts of kidnapping and one count of attempted murder. Anthony will be up for parole again in 2025, and Nathaniel comes up in 2018. So did he rat his brother out? Did he? No, he pled guilty. No, it was all he, the, he had the a confession. DNA evidence. Okay, yeah. So I he mean, that's really rat. the biggest thing. I want to see a brother rat another brother out, but that doesn't happen. Blood is thick in the water, you know? <laughs> so interesting to note, their brother Hayes Cook, too, would later be arrested for rape and sent to prison. Yeah, so the youngest brother was also, he wasn't part of the initial crimes with the two brothers, but yeah. was separately. He didn't go on, like, the, the, tra- the, the little trip. <laughs> the yeah. traveling pants brotherhood <laughs> yeah. rape murder spree. He, but he did his own thing, and I guess apparently He's he just independent. Up. He's yeah. a really independent spirit. Yeah. <laughs> He didn't make a name for himself, so... Oh, Jesus. Way to go, Or, Hayes. you know, in that family, how are you going to stand out? Yeah. You just want to, like, have mom pay attention to me. <laughs> Look, I raped someone, too. You guys, you guys, pay attention. <laughs> I can totally murder as well. <laughs> oh, so moving on to the Briley brothers. Anthony, Linwood, and James Briley, three brothers this time, came from a stable two-parent home on the northeast side of Richmond. And this is where they differ. Like, it seems like the parents had it together. Like, oh, okay, so they're not divorced, they're not yeah. abusive or whatever. It's a well, difference, might... a big difference mm-hmm. with the other stories. They were described by neighbors as nice boys willing to help fix cars or mow lawns. Within the household, however, the boys seem to have a darker side. Though, so unlike many serial killers, reports say the parents seem to be very present and active in the boys' lives, but the boys still seem to gravitate towards violence and darkness. So it doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't fucking matter if your parents were good or they're yeah. together. It doesn't fucking matter. You beat them or not. I they mean, mow lawns. You're right. The, but just most of the time, it doesn't help if your parents are divorced yeah. and shitty. <laughs> yeah, my parents are divorced and shitty. And you're not killing anybody. I'm fucking proud of you. Yeah, woo. <laughs> not today. <laughs> Tomorrow's a new day. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, apparently collected deadly pets such as tarantulas, piranhas, dobermans, and boa constrictors. Where the fuck do you get a piranha? Ebay. That's the, my biggest question. <laughs> eBay? <laughs> China. I don't know. Uh, they just mail them over. Yeah, I mean, tarantulas aren't deadly. Piranhas aren't really deadly. And Dobermans. What the fuck? Kelly's I mean, he's a science nerd. Yeah. <laughs> Bubble constrictors, I can see that. But Dobermans, like... I don't know, but they're all, like, reading that, like, the connotation in my head is not good. They're yeah. not cuddly animals. Yeah. They're not, like, you know... Well, my brothers had fire ants, so what the fuck? 
well, how the fuck is a fire ant a pet? <laughs> it's not deadly, but it's stupid. Yeah, like, well, yeah. It's yeah. just, no, I mean, they're going to get like out. A, that's a, an Australian pet. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like all of these are probably Australian yeah. pets. Like, he was just the cuddliest piranha. <laughs> Uh, the boys watched with glee when they would feed live mice to their boa constrictor. I mean, I feel like a lot of boys do that. I, thought, I don't feel like that's that crazy. But I thought you said they would watch glee. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Jane this. Lynch and watching mice die. Those are my two interests. It's on my Tinder profile. Uh, that's the worst part. I mean, it, it used to be cool to me. It's like we used to have snakes and then you'd feed like fish to them which was kind of cool until my dad put a fish in there and it bit his fucking hand oh. which was hilarious because <gasps> he freaked out <laughs> which is so good was he just like shaking he his was hand shaking with his snake his touch? <laughs> that's amazing it was so good oh man their father james senior was unnerved enough by their scary behavior that he kept his bedroom door padlocked from the inside overnight not get them help i'm just gonna protect myself seriously i mean you're the one living in the house but can't you just take them to a therapist there's so many things you could do instead of just like getting a padlock and just beat the weird out of them (laughs) that's always an option (laughs) <laughs> Linwood was the oldest and most calculating of the Briley brothers. James Briley was about two years younger than his brother and apparently was more the muscle or um, <laughs> what, or the wild card. Oh, <laughs> As in <Mac>. always sunny. <laughs> I love this quote. The prosecutor once said about James that he had the face of a man who was born to die in the electric chair. He wasn't bright like Linwood. He was cold. That is fucking crazy. Does he have like deep eyes? Right? Like, like I would never want to ha- – like if you had that face, get plastic surgery. Yeah. Just my suggestion. Just well, some someone advice. told me that I – like when I told him I was into like crime and murder and all that, they were like, yeah, I could see that you have really deep eyes. Like you, of course, <laughs> you might murder someone. I was like, I- <laughs> All right. You have the face of a murderer. Yeah. yeah. Holy shit. Thank you. That's awful. Yeah. I was smiling. Than than as a woman, someone walking up to you and being like, you look, are you pregnant? Yeah. (laughs) I'd rather have that than, are you a murderer? (laughs) Yeah. You have a murderer face. Yeah. (laughs) He didn't want my number after that. So, (laughs) good. Mission accomplished. Yes. The youngest brother, Anthony Briley, took part in the vicious robbery and murder rampage, but there was no evidence that he personally killed anyone. So he was likely the most passive. The motive for James and Linwood was usually to eliminate witnesses to the robberies they committed, but they also seemed to take some pleasure in their work. The police did not connect the crimes and see a pattern at first because the crimes had so much versatility. Yeah, I mean, versatility is one word for it, and we'll explore the the details, of course, but it's pretty gnarly. (laughs) <laughs> At just 16 years old, Anthony shot and killed an elderly woman named Orlean Christian while she was hanging laundry in her backyard. Ah. Yeah. Her husband had recently passed away, so initially it was thought to be a result of a heart attack. Later, a murder investigation was opened after a gun wound was found. And this drives me crazy because <laughs> shouldn't that be the first thing you notice that this lady is bleeding from a hole in her body then you know like maybe she was on her period (laughs) good point (laughs) i'm no doctor but i think this lady is menstruating where's the vagina look is it under the rib up here like is it in the head yeah i don't i don't know how bodies it's the neck i've I've never made a woman (laughs) orgasm so i'm not clear (laughs) so they found this gunshot wound they uh figured out it was a murder just because someone was super (laughs) shitty at their job and didn't notice at first. Open so, and close case, Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> using a reenactment, uh, using a reenactment experiment, the police deduced that the shot could only have come from the Briley house. When they searched the house, they found Linwood's gun, which fired the fatal shots. Ooh. Linwood admitted to the crime with indifference, saying, "I heard she had heart problems. She probably would have died soon anyway." What a I mean, dick. is he wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Again, we don't know the lady. Maybe he did her a favor. She was like, I'm fucking super sad. I'm hanging laundry by myself. And my husband used to sit there and chill with me. Oh. 
I'm just kidding. She wanted to watch Golden <laughs> Girls and chill out. She's like, I can watch all my TV shows. <laughs> yeah. All my stories uninterrupted. I don't have to watch sports anymore. Orlean's got the remote now. It's my time. <laughs> <laughs> Orlean's time to shine. <laughs> oh, we're going to hell. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> His younger brother, James, followed in his path at the same age and was sentenced to time in juvenile hall for pulling a gun and firing upon a police officer in the midst of a pursuit. He's ballsy. The first attack carried out by the collective group of Briley brothers and their accomplice, Duncan Meekins, occurred on March 12th of 1979. The Briley's knocked on William and Virginia Butcher's door shortly before 9 p.m., Butcher figured it was the paper boy coming to collect payment. That is so adorable. Aww. So he answered the door. Instead, Briley was there explaining that his car had broken down and he needed to call AAA. Butcher said he would gladly call for him and told the man to give him his AAA card. Briley Smart. fumbled around and pulled out a card just when Butcher cracked open the screen door to get the AAA card. Briley pulled a gun <sighs> and barged inside. I feel if someone you don't know is knocking at your door, I don't give a fuck who it is. When, when, like, Jehovah's Witnesses, when yeah. any of the religious people with all their literature come yeah. to me, I'm like, get the fuck out of my house. Every, like, I don't even answer. Sometimes I'll pull the curtains aside <laughs> and look them in the eye and just point to the street. <laughs> I'm like, not even playing. I just look at him and I point. I'm not opening the door for a fucking, a, an 80 year old lady has been at my door and I'm like, nope. I'm nope. the exact opposite. I'm, you just want to talk to people. Yeah, I'm praying it's a Girl Scout or something. <laughs> like, I have company. Yay. Or Can just, I make you lemonade? Like, I don't really want to talk about Jesus, but I guess I'll talk about Jesus. Like, <laughs> Or be like, oh, our neighbors love Jesus. You should go talk to them. <laughs> like, Pointing them in the other direction. Yeah. That's a good tactic. Maybe you, I should do that. Like, get the fuck out. <laughs> Scream it through. So Virginia Boucher looked up and saw the man walking towards her with a gun at her husband's head. I know. And a knife at his throat, which is excessive. Yeah, that's, again, the two-hand thing, chopsticks. and I'm not that coordinated. Yeah, I'll drop something and then the whole thing's a mess and I'm clumsy as fuck. (laughs) The Boucher's were forced to lie on the floor in separate rooms, then they were bound with rope. Mm. William Boucher believes the person who tied him up was Meekins because he seemed especially young and inexperienced. Uh, wait. Couldn't tie How did not. William know? He's like, this guy's never tied anybody up before. Here, I'll He's do like, it myself. I've had enough dominatrixes to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the hell? So Butcher kept telling him not to tie the rope too tight because it would hurt. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, But he's chopping from the bottom. Anyway, (laughs) (laughs) Meekins listened to Butcher and left the rope slightly loose, which probably saved the Butcher's life. Why would you live? Like, I'm going to be like, oh, okay. Worst criminal ever. Yeah. What an idiot. Yeah. The Briley gang ransacked the house, sprayed lighter fluid around, and lit the house on fire. As soon as the Briley's left, Butcher wiggled one hand free and untied himself. He grabbed a knife from the kitchen and cut his wife loose. Yes. Yep. They ran outside to safety and survived. Yes. Yay, the butchers. The Briley's stole the couple's car and abandoned it. They took two televisions and other items, including the butcher's 32 caliber gun and his police scanner. I feel like butcher's uh, butcher's a serial killer himself because he's got a police scanner, 32 caliber <laughs> no, gun. He's giving him fucking tips on time. Tying. Yeah, like what is going on here? Yeah, that's a little suspect. Yeah, that's weird. But also I feel like it's not uncommon, you know, for people to have police scanners. I feel like that's a thing I hear from people that are... Drug maybe. dealers? <laughs> <laughs> the only people I know that have police scanners are drug dealers. Well, not here in LA, but I feel like that's a thing that I've heard if you're watching like Forensic Files or any of those old like 90s yeah. crime shows. They're like, well, so-and-so was listening to a police scanner and heard a commotion down their street or whatever. You're looking for trouble. <laughs> right? right? They're like police chasers yeah. or something. It's like um, the Neighborhood Watch. Yeah. When they just want to go out and do their own thing. Maybe. Maybe Maybe he's just a real hero and we're making him out to be some gnarly dude. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, he almost died. I'm sorry. He's a a hero. He's he's awesome. (laughs) Over the next seven months, the brothers terrorized the city of Richmond and murdered at random. 
In one case, Linwood crushed a teenager, Christopher Phillips' skull, with a cinder block after suspecting the teen had tried to break into his no. car. Oh. That's, that's a lot. Not that big of a deal. It's just a car, dude. Slap on the wrist. Not, uh, not murder someone with a cinder block. Yeah, that's gnarly. Cinder block? Yeah. It's in messy. another, they bashed in the head of a 75 year old Blanche Page as she lay in bed. Then, Aww. Charles Garner's body was discovered with knives, scissors, and a carving fork Ugh. sticking out of it. Yeah, that's fucked. The Briley gang lit a fire on his back using the yellow pages. <laughs> Michael Mc- uh. was shot and robbed by the gang in his home on March 21st. On April 9th, the gang followed 76-year-old Mary Gowan across town from her babysitting job then raped, robbed, and shot her to death outside her home. No. I know. One of the murder victims was country western disc jockey. Wait, country and western disc jockey? (laughs) You do both? (laughs) You are so versatile. Yeah, this is the versatility. I love this. This great. (laughs) So they murdered uh, John Gallagher, known as Johnny G the disc jockey. (laughs) He'd been playing bass with a band at the Log Cabin Dance Hall. I bet you he fucks. <laughs> I mean, my name's Johnny G and I get the pussy. Yeah. I'm just saying. Um, the G stands for gets pussy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what the G is for. Now I get it. Thanks for explaining it to me. <laughs> He'd been playing bass with the band at Log Cabin Dance Hall on Jefferson Davis Highway and stepped outside between sets when the Briley brothers abducted him on September 14th, 1979. They robbed him and took him to Mayo Island. Linwood Briley shot him and fishermen found his body two days later, partially submerged in the James River. Mm-mm. Linwood was actually sentenced to death for that killing. When arrested months later, Linwood was still wearing the ring stolen from Gallagher's hand. Fucking Again, idiot. Again, like, if you take something, get rid of it. Pawn it. Jeez. Like every other person. Seriously. Like, learn from the crackheads. Just, you know, pawn you guys it. always learn from the crackheads. Yeah. Just. So, um, it's kind of unrelated to the sequence of the stories, but I found this, um, just little tidbit. The Briley brothers were under surveillance because of suspicion that they were connected with the crimes. One night, a police investigator, Shirley Englehart, was alone in a surveillance van and heard James and Linwood arguing outside their house about whether the police were inside the van (laughs) watching them. Uh, James didn't think so, but Linwood did. Linwood's smart. (laughs) (laughs) The brothers walked up on the green Chevy van looked through the tinted windows, and started shaking the vehicle. Hmm. James fired a gun into the air and into the ground of their yard. He said if the police were inside the van, they would have stormed out after the gunshots. So that settled the argument, and they got in their car and drove away. No! That's so amazing. <laughs> like, I know it's not related to the timeline, but I just had to include That's that. That's so Because when I found that, it just cracked me up. Back to the sequence of events. On the morning of October 19th, James Briley made a court appearance and promised the judge that he was staying out of trouble while out on parole for the 1973 robbery and malicious wounding conviction. But then... He went with the gang to brutalize more victims the same night. The Briley's randomly saw a longtime neighborhood friend, Harvey Wilkerson. Upon seeing the gang's presence down the street, Wilkerson instinctively closed and locked his front door. The gang saw that. They walked over to the Wilkerson's front door and knocked. Terrified by the response, if he refused them entry, Wilkerson allowed them in. Harvey Wilkerson and his 23-year-old wife, Judy Barton, who was five months pregnant, were overpowered, bound and gagged with duct tape. Linwood Briley then manhandled Judy Barton into the kitchen, where she was raped within hearing distance of the others. Mm. (sighs) Fellow gang member Duncan Meekins continued the sexual assault, after which Linwood dragged Barton back into the living room, briefly rummaged the premises for valuables, then left the house. The three remaining gang members covered the victims with sheets. JB told Meekins, you've got to get one, at which point Meekins took a pistol and fatally shot Harvey Wilkerson in the head. Peer pressure. Jesus. 
James Briley then shot Barton and the five-year-old boy. Police happened to be in the general vicinity of the neighborhood, heard the shots, and later saw the gang members running down the street at high speed. They didn't know where the shots had been fired. The bodies were not discovered until three days following the crime, but the Brileys were soon rounded up afterwards. During the interrogation by police, Duncan Meekins was offered a plea agreement in return for turning in the state's evidence against the Brileys. He took their offer and recounted full details of the seven-month crime spree. As a result, he escaped the death penalty and was briefly incarcerated at Virginia prison away from the Briley brothers. (laughs) <laughs> Again, like the brothers don't turn on each other, but when they invite someone else in, it's the other person that turns. Yeah. A single life sentence with parole eligibility was handed down to Anthony Briley, the youngest brother of the trio, due to his limited involvement in the killings. Again, he was the one that didn't do any of the actual murders. He just chilled out. Yeah. He just chilled, watched, yeah. stood in the corner. Jerked off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I mean by watched. (laughs) Because of Virginia's trigger man statute, both James and Linwood received numerous life sentences for murders committed during the spree, but faced with capital charges only in cases where they had physically committed the actual killings of the victims. Linwood was sentenced to death for the abduction and murder of John Gallagher, while James received two death sentences, one each of the murders of Judy Barton and her son Harvey. So both were sentenced to death row at M- Mecklenburg. <laughs> Me- Mecklenburg. They were on death row at Mclemore Correctional Center. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> Near boy boy bands, <laughs> whatever that is. So Mecklenburg Correctional Center near Boydton in er- early 1980. These are terrible names in every Seriously. single one of these cases. Rename your cities. Yeah. Just think about this later on when people are going to be doing a podcast about you. Pick a better name. <laughs> They were disruptive inmates who used their guile and physical prowess to threaten fellow inmates and guards alike. A flourishing drug and weapons trade operated at the prison under their command. No way. Yeah. (laughs) There's no drugs in jail. No. Oh my God, are you crazy? So they were the ringleaders in the six inmate escape from death row on May 31st, 1984. What? Yeah. Six people. During the early moments of the escape, in which a coordinated effort resulted in inmates taking over the death row unit, both Briley's expressed a strong interest in killing the officers that they had taken hostage. They went so far as to douse captive guards in lighter fluid and were prepared to toss a lit match to complete the action. I'd quit my job after that. Right? Never again. Workers comp? Yeah. Yeah. Willie Lloyd Turner, another death row inmate, stepped in the way of James Briley and forbade him from throwing the match. Meanwhile, Alexandria, Virginia, and cop killer Wilbert Evans prevented Linwood Briley from raping a female nurse who had been taken hostage while en route to delivering medication to inmates in the unit. Okay. So, of the death row inmates, it seems like the Brileys are the fucking They're worst. They're the worst. They're like, hey, man, that's a little... And the other guys were like, dude, chill. Like, I know we killed, raped, murdered, and all that. Yeah. But seriously, you guys are too much. Yeah. We Jesus. can't handle. So, splitting off from their two remaining free escapees at Philadelphia, the Brileys went to live with their uncle in the north part of the city. Wouldn't you go somewhere else? Like, don't they know who your family is and they would come to try and find you? Yeah. That seems just stupid. They were captured on June 19th by heavily firepowered and a mass group of FBI agents and police. They returned to Virginia. Few sought to plead for their lives to be spared. In short order, the remaining appeals heard by some 70 different appellate judges ran out for both. I mean, can't blame a guy for trying. Yeah. They were executed in the electric chair at the Virginia State Penitentiary. Linwood was put to death in Virginia's electric chair on October 12th in 1984. James Briley was executed in the same manner on April 18th of the following year. At no point did either Briley admit responsibility or express remorse for their horrific crimes. Rather, they seemed embarrassed only that they had been captured upon making their escape. I hate these guys. <laughs> the younger brother, Anthony, remains incarcerated in Virginia's correction system and comes up for parole consideration every few years. To date, his application for parole has been denied by the state parole board. Yeah. As it should be. 
Thank goodness. They're yeah. never going to. Yeah. You're just going to grow old there. Yeah. Yeah. As you well, should. I would hope so because if he comes up for parole and they give it to him, that would be fucking insane. Yeah, there's not enough good deeds in the world to yeah. fix any it's of like that. He was just he like grew a garden. Yeah, got his GED. Like, you know. uh, come on. Yeah, no thanks. All right, so that has been our brother's episode of Murder Dictionary podcast. Woo! Thanks again for fucking listening. Uh, check us out on social media: Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and also like, rate, review, subscribe. We yeah. really appreciate All it. That. And uh, also, if you could tell anybody you know, if you know someone that's into true crime and you want to give them a recommendation, just let them know that Murder Dictionary podcast is super awesome. Yeah. Tell your friends, tell your family. And thanks again for listening. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.